Financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report with Michael Hartsman and Dominic Tavella. We'll break down the news, trends, and overall direction of the markets, telling you what may be coming next, investment opportunities, and what to avoid. Now, here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartsman. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman. Today is Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. And I'm on, as always, with my partner, Dominic Tavella. How are you this evening? Doing well. Thank you, Mike. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Everything is good, thank God. No complaints. So, you know, Dom, last week we, we were discussing whether the little rally that we had in the market was a bit of a head fake or was the, was the worst of the selling behind us. And although we've had a couple of good days in a row, we had a good little rally today, I'm still not sure whether we're in head fake mode or or if this is sustainable, because we still have this, you know, this black cloud, which I think will be with us for a while about interest rates going up. Um, and it's not even, will they go up? Now it's a matter of how many times and how aggressive will they go up? Yeah, so uh, as you pointed out, Mike, uh, the markets overall had an, a nice week. The S&P uh, was up about one and a half percent. The NASDAQ about two and a half percent. Mm -hmm but still negative for the year, not anywhere near as much as they were. Um, and I think the key is uh, exactly what you pointed out. Uh, I think you brought it up in this morning's uh, call where Bank America is talking about seven, seven rate hikes this year. And remember just uh, three, four months ago, they were talking about two, maybe three. Um, Goldman Sachs brought that number up to five rate hikes this year. And uh, Bank of America, I guess in an attempt to top Goldman, says seven. So look, uh, the more aggressive the Fed is going to be in their interest rate tightening cycle, um, you know, the, mar the markets are, are not going to take kindly to that, right? So they're going to they're gonna have to walk uh, a tightrope and we get some additional data this week. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And, and, and to your point, you know, I was reading the, the notes we get every Monday morning from JP Morgan, and um, they were saying that six months ago, we were predicting one interest rate hike in 2022, and maybe we could postpone it to 2023. So the world has changed quickly in six months, which is typical for us. We see that all the time. But, I, you know, the other side of that is the jobs number, Dominic, was really, really good on Friday. And this is what's so frustrating. So we should be cheering that we have good job numbers, right? But that's what now causes more interest rate anxiety. Yeah, it's the unfortunately, but good news is bad news. So right. uh, the word, the singular word that's creating this headache is inflation. Um, better job numbers uh, means wages go higher, uh, wait, uh, em employees are able to ask for and get higher wages. That's inflationary. Whether we like it or not, that's inflationary and puts the Fed in a position where they have to tighten more than they want to. Um, look, if we could uh, unplug inflation out of this equation, we are in Shangri-La. Good economic growth, good corporate profits, good employment numbers. I mean, for, mo for the most part, the data is pretty positive, right, Mike? Pretty positive. But when you have the prices of energy, food, transportation, housing going up aggressively every day, um, that, that's a real crimp in the style of economic growth. Yes. However, it's not the first interest rate cycle we've lived through. Interest rates are supposed to go up. Inflation is supposed to creep into the economy. And I think the reason we have these spurts of, of buying is I still think the general consensus is that what you just said, Dominic, that long term, the economy is in good shape, which is why we have good job numbers. Yeah. And look, uh, Mike, uh, I know it's kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times obvious doesn't work in our business. But there are companies out there that are really doing well. There are companies out there that are actually making money. 
Um, and we really have a story of the haves and the have nots. So the more speculative stocks, and we've talked a lot about this, the more speculative companies that don't make a lot of money or maybe don't make any money at all, they're projecting that maybe someday they will, those companies have really, really been punished. And the companies that do well, have done well, have good profits, good growth and good expectations for future growth, those companies have prospered. So the Facebooks on one side that just have gotten pummeled, right? That stock has gotten lost 25, 30% of its value in a week. Um, and then, you know, Google on the other side, which tech is not supposed to be doing well, but it's done well, right? It's done well relative to, to other companies. So the haves are companies doing well and can grow. The have nots, the companies have disappointed. Those stocks have gotten really punished. Well, you know, we love our cliches and what we do for a living. So it's a stock picker's market. How, how many times have we have we heard that one, Dominic? So here we are again. Um, so tonight, Dom, just to switch gears a little bit, we, we have a, a guest tonight that's, that's from Schroeder's. He's in charge of sustainability. He's one of the investment directors. His name is Laz Tiant. Tiant. He's kind enough to join us this evening talk about a unique sector of the market, ESG. Um, it's, it's grown over the years, and we're really looking forward to his, his thoughts on where ESG is now and where it fits into someone's portfolio. Yeah, this is a, a, a very hot subject matter today, and it, it, it should be. Comp corporations should be you know, responsible citizens, should act and behave that way, should treat their employees with dignity and respect. And, and so investors are literally knocking on our door going, hey, if I'm going to put money at work, I want to have those dollars focused also in a responsible manner, right? So um, you know, we used to call this socially responsible, right, Mike? You and I are old mm -hmm. enough and been in the industry long enough that, that we used to call these socially responsible funds or portfolios. Um, today, they are ESG portfolios. So same, uh, same thing, good companies doing good business, taking care of their, their, their employees, their climate, their uh, environmental uh, impact minimized. It's a good, healthy place to put and allocate dollars. And feel good about it. So we will be right back with Laz Tiant from Schroeder's. Back to the Labenthal Report. Right on, Michael Hartsman, back with Dominic Tavella and our special guest this evening, Laz Tiant from Schroeder's. How are you, Laz? Doing well. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you, Dom. Welcome, Laz, and thank you for joining us this evening. Much appreciated. So, Laz, let's start this conversation from 50,000 feet in the air. Um, I know you're in charge of sustainability, otherwise known as socially responsible back in the day. Now we call it ESG. What does ESG actually stand for? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And it's, it's not easy to distill it in a single thought. So I'll, I'll try to do the best I can. I think first, you know, understanding how a company is operating and it's considering the needs of all the stakeholders. So that includes employees, suppliers, customers, their regulators, their shareholders, local communities, and the environment, right? Focusing on how the companies are treating all of those stakeholders alongside traditional financial analysis, it just provides a fuller picture of both a company's vulnerabilities, as well as its ability to address and protect shareholder value. Uh, the way I see it, ultimately, a, a sustainable business is one that is managed for the long term. If a business considers the impact it has across all of its stakeholders, then it should be better placed to grow, deliver returns for shareholders, and provide secure jobs for employees, be a reliable partner for their suppliers, right? And so a business that does not consider those stakeholders leaves itself open to all kinds of risks. So those could be reputational, financial, operational, or, or all of the above, right? So when we think about sustainability, ESG investing, it's about having the full picture, making sure there aren't blind spots as just a, a foundation and element of the investment process, again, as a, a starting point. And then a good solid portfolio manager will do what he or she is good after that and pick good companies and engage with those companies to influence their long-term growth prospects. So, Les, and I don't want to start with a difficult question right off the bat, but there aren't really any rules on what this actually 
means, right? Isn't it up to each company to decide what the definition of that actually means? Or there are guidelines out there that we need to follow? More and more over the years, I'd say over the past five years, has been a growing list of, I would say, what are deemed to be more inline factors that can be considered financially material for industries, sub-industries and companies specifically, right? And so that's to say certain industries have certain vulnerabilities and risks that others don't. Um, carbon intensity um, and certain supply chain risks might matter more to utility companies than let's say a, a book publisher, right? And so understanding how a company's operating, where it's operating, the local regulations for that industry is becoming increasingly important. So there are more and more standards that investors can look to, to understand where to start essentially. So Les, to your point, you know, portfolio managers should look towards companies that are, are good citizens, right? So are you more involved in, in funds that are in totally wrapped up in ESG? Because can't you make the argument that every portfolio manager, no matter what style that they're managing, should consider ESG when they're looking at a company? 100%. And I've spoken to accountless portfolio managers over my career. And a solid portfolio manager would be considering data privacy and security if they're looking at an internet software company, right? So as a starting point to understanding where there's risks and opportunities, yes every portfolio manager should be considering sustainability and ESG factors. Now, the way Schroeder's is looking at it, there's a bit of a spectrum, right? Foundationally, everything we do is integrated, meaning that those business risks are realized and understood at the company level, right? To understand those business prospects and where to engage. But you can fine tune it in and let's say have actual objectives for sustainable criteria that can actually have some outcome orientation to an investment thesis. So in the middle bucket, we have what we call sustainable strategies, which might, you know, for example, seek to be less carbon intensive than its benchmark or seek to have certain criteria that, you know, relates to a company's impact on society versus the benchmark. Additionally, kind of taking it on the furthest end is what we look at in terms of impact investing, right? And that's where you're seeing you know, emerging technologies that might be helping combat climate change, for example, so renewable energy, and focusing strategies around those kind of, uh, let's say, emerging components that are helping a societal need, whether it's for people or for the planet generally. And so that's kind of the spectrum that we look at it. And essentially with that, we're just trying to meet the market where they're at, right? Meet your clients where they're at, because some people just want to make sure there's a risk adjusted view of those sustainability risks and that it's taken into account, but others might want those measurable sustainable outcomes and seek returns while doing it. You're not giving those up, but actually having something a bit more tangible that you might want to latch on to in terms of what's important to you from an investment process. So Laz, I mean, it kind of is common sense, I'll say that if you have a company that's a good corporate citizen, treats its employees right, uh, looks at uh, how it impacts the environment, um, you know, it doesn't get in trouble, right? Doesn't risk, have reputational risk and perhaps the regulators don't come or customers don't come and, and pound on it. But what I'm noticing day to day now is maybe it's window dressing, maybe it's real, where a lot of companies are approaching this particular issue because we are becoming more and more sensitive to it every day. And you see, and I don't want to pick on the oil companies and go, oh, we're reducing our carbon footprint. Well, how is an oil company reducing its carbon footprint? Again, I don't want to pick on oil companies, but I want to do talk about this issue of window dressing. Is it real? How do you guys look at it and go, you know what, this is legit, this is impactful, or no, this is, this is just window dressing? Mm -hmm. With all things, devil's in the details, right? And so when we think about sustainability risks that a company might be exposed to, we want to be able to look at their policies, their programs, and their management systems that should be implemented and have a history of that implementation, understand how robust are your procedures in addressing some of these related risks. For energy, oil and gas companies, utility companies, what are the forward-looking perspectives that you can provide in understanding how you might be decarbonizing into the future? And so how are businesses evolving over time to bring into, uh, bring into fold new, again, technologies that might not be available and scalable today, like hydrogen, 
like um, wind and solar that have now become a bit more cost competitive. Um, about 10 years ago, they weren't, right? So it's about understanding those longer term prospects and how companies are evolving their businesses, given both the societal pressures as well as the regulatory pressures, right? And those two converging together really are changing the landscape of how we evaluate companies given the impacts they push off to society, but really how their financials ultimately can be affected given those policies and the changing landscape that's kind of happening globally. We're you know, a global asset manager, right? And I think when people think of Schroeder's, they think of international or emerging markets, right? And I think now people think about sustainability as well because we've been able to really think about those different factors and apply that in a way that's speaking to, again, the different audiences that we serve, whether those are asset owners and, and pensions or um, wealth and retail folks. I was, you know, I was Dominic, I guess Dominic, I've been doing this a long time because I was going to ask him, I was going to ask you a similar question. Um, especially climate control, cl I'm, I'm sorry, climate change. It is still a certain part of the country where people roll their eyes over climate change. Let's say what climate change is three degrees outside. There's no climate change. So, so, to, so similar to Dominic's question, how do you know how do, you, how do you know the difference between someone just making it window dressing and saying, yes, we believe in climate change versus living it? And the flip side of that is, do they ever take into their account that their, their clientele, right, their customers may also roll their eyes at the, at, at the thought of climate change? And is there ever an unintended consequence that someone who embraces climate change, want, yeah, Wall Street may agree, but their customer base may say, you know, another woke company or, you know, another company is going to be canceled if they don't if they don't jump on the climate change bus. So how do they balance that? It comes down to education, you know, and, and that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation today, because that's where I'm spending a lot of my time to be able to bring forth a lot of these issues in a digestible way for individual investors. I think on an institutional level, people understand it and capital is moving, right, to solve a lot of these problems. But, you know, take, give, let me give you an example. Think about the, the food and water systems, right? Our, our current food and water systems are currently very unsustainable and are experiencing an unprecedented convergence of pressures over the next 30 years. By 2050, the world will need to produce 70% more food and more drinking water while producing less carbon and using 70% fewer resources. Regulation, uh, consumer behavior, new technologies, it's all changing fast. And now they're starting to impact that long overdue change that's required to make the whole system less carbon intensive, wasteful and, and polluting while also improving biodiversity and encouraging you know, healthier diets globally. And so when we're thinking about these risks, it's also becoming opportunities, right? So when we think about these estimations and the structural shifts, this are, are gonna require trillions of dollars in the next, 50 years to be able to actually understand and target a global and societal need. And so, you know, food and, and water systems is one. We're also thinking about this from an education perspective, health access, sustainable transportation. So you think about seeing more electric vehicles on the road, juxtaposing that with policy that's putting being put out in the U.S. for infrastructure development. Well, once you see that infrastructure development put in place, you're going to see more charging stations. Once you see more charging stations, you're going to see more electric vehicles. So these advancements are already in motion. We might just be seeing early stages of it, but these companies, these businesses are becoming more cost competitive. They're getting a lot of, let's say, um, uh, push and momentum from the government. And therefore, you know, even in the U.S., it's going to be more evident in our everyday lives. And so at some point, it's all about proof being in the pudding and seeing what's in front of your own eyes. But right now, we're just trying to educate on where the situation currently is. And in real time, with our investment dollars, try to highlight where we can all be taking advantage of opportunities. Because I can look at an infrastructure build or build back better plan, and then directly speak to where there will be investment opportunity in the public equity, private equity, and credit space um, that, you know, we can apply our dollars too. Unless even, even if I want to put my greed hat on, right? And this is kind of the way I approach it with some of my clients. Um, 
whether you believe that uh, climate change is as dramatic as some people say it is or isn't going to be down the road, uh, having a tanker not spill oil in the Gulf of Mexico or polluting a stream or the air or treating your employees correctly or your community correctly, that's ultimately positive for the company, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if you create a, a negative drama event from a corporate governance perspective or an environmental impact perspective, that's gonna be very negative on your company stock. So even if you wanna put your green hat on and aren't totally buying into the climate change argument, um, you certainly want to be a good citizen because ultimately your company is going to suffer if you're not. Yeah, no problem is a good problem, right? And so you want to avoid business interruption and where you see business interruption, typically you can point to uh, an ESG factor or a sustainability topic that might be leading to that. Um, again, using data privacy and security as an example, you see that affecting healthcare companies, banks, technology companies, right? And that's our data. And so ensuring that companies have that managed properly affects all of us. And so that, that's what it's all about. Just making sure people are talking the talk, walking the walk, and protecting shareholder value just by doing good due diligence and being buttoned up. And, and Laz, it's more than just climate change, right? Or not, uh, and not, those things are important. But, but the whole social part of it or societal part of it, right? The whole diversity part of it. And, and as Dom said, and you said, treating employees and customers with dignity has, I think, in the last five years become super important. Absolutely. I, I look at that from a couple perspectives. If you think about the top of the house for companies, executive management, boards, you need diversity of thought. You can't have the same four people of the same creed and color making decisions. I think it needs to be a mix of gender and racial diversity, um, educational background, skills and expertise to be making those decisions to make companies profitable and, and have some future prospects. At the same time, when you think about what it takes to have a properly trained work staff, understanding where there might be employee turnover rate and what's driving that employee turnover rate and making sure that you're not in a industry or sector whereby if you're losing your employees, they're gonna go benefit some other company. Think about the major electric vehicle manufacturers here in the United States. There's one big one, and a few other ones that are emerging. The one big one has an employee turnover rate problem, right? And so when you think about other you know, US auto companies starting to build out electric vehicles, there is IP going from one company to another. So when we talk about employee retention, it's not just about losing a, an employee, they're there, they're there today, not there tomorrow. It's about one, a cost associated with losing that employee from a dollar perspective and rehiring and retraining somebody. Or not, then, being, or not even being able to hire somebody because the reputation of your company now is so far down the scale that I wouldn't want to work for that company anyway. That and the intellectual property go into your emerging competitor. To your competitor. Yeah. It, does, it does seem from a corporate point of view that we've almost reached a point of zero tolerance. Um, and, 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 and now look at, look at the Aaron Rodgers story in the fall where you know, he basically lied about being vaccinated. And I, I think it was less than 24 hours that State Farm didn't fire him but they, they, they iced all his commercials for an extended period of time. They just did not want his face connected with, with their logo. And as I said, the, the decision to do that was almost instantaneous. So the question then becomes, are they living their values or do they not want the negative publicity or is it a combination of both? It depends on the company, but yeah, I think it, in some cases it's a combination of both, right? Um, companies do care about their reputational standing and sometimes when it comes to the marketing and PR perspective that, that might take precedence but from an investor perspective we want to make sure that the the business in terms of what might be an investment risk for shareholders mm -hmm. meaning if an issue is not managed properly I might see that on quarterly earnings in terms of them paying for that and it coming out of those quarterly profits I care about that as well I want to make sure that those operations run uh, undisrupted, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so while there can be reputational damage that comes from it, it, it 
a toll is taken mostly when it comes to investment risk issues. So, uh, Laz, we're getting close to the end, so maybe we're going to pick this up and talk about it a little bit in the next segment. But you guys are a global money manager, and at least my experience, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like Europe has been a little bit ahead on this environmental uh, issue, uh, the U.S. behind, and China and the Far East way behind. Would you say corporations in Europe have a head start? And uh, is my thesis basically on uh, spot on, or I got that one wrong? Well, I would say both the corporate space and investment space are, are well ahead. On, on the corporate side, you have industries, take climate issues as an example. You know, you have companies that have to be worried about carbon taxes, depending on what industry they are operating in. Whereas that's not necessarily happening across the United States and maybe other developed markets yet. Um, when it comes to the investors, there's already a bit more concrete, let's say rules or guidance as it relates to, if I'm building a sustainable strategy, you will know what it means when I say sustainable, right? Because there's rules that I need to abide by in that measurement. And so there's more clarity being put towards investors to understand their optionality from an investment standpoint as relates to ESG um, strategies. That's on its way here in the, the US. The, the Department of Labor is already making moves with proposed rules going out in the fall, with hopefully those being finalized at some point um, this quarter, which will make it hopefully a, a bit um, easier, at least on the retirement side for ESG factors to be part of the process and you know, part of the fiduciary responsibility to consider these factors as risks. So more guidance is definitely coming here in the US, but other markets such as Europe are, are, are well ahead. The first time I saw a charging station for, for a car was in Paris eight years ago. And they're mm -hmm. all over Paris. The cars are half the size and, and you know obviously the roads are a lot more narrow, but that was literally the first time I saw a charging station for an automobile automobile was not in this country. And even now, Laz, they're just not, they're not everywhere. They're not ubiquitous, right? You still have to seek one out. If you have an electric vehicle, they're not, you know, every half a mile, like a payphone used to be. Yeah. And part of that's the need for infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. I, I see charging stations more at hospitals and corporate centers than I mm -hmm. do on the side of the road. Right. And that's, private companies being able to bring those on to their properties, whereas public infrastructure needs to be led through the government. And so there is potential for that to continue happening, given where things would be with the infrastructure and build back better um, plans. Um, however, you know, that's yet to be seen and, and implemented. But I think that's where we're heading. And Laz, a big component of that, of course, was, you know, energy prices in Europe are substantially higher than they are here and have been here. Um, and so kind of they had a gun to their head. They had to look for alternative energy sources, wind and solar um, to supplement uh, what carbon uh, producing fuels uh, cost, right? So they kind of got a head start. If no other reason, they didn't have a choice. Yeah, and those uh, energy mixes, solar, wind, they're actually good cost competitive businesses now from an investment standpoint. If I was having this conversation 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't be saying the same. Those businesses struggled um, but, and you know, relied on government subsidies as well. But now those companies are on their own two feet, diversifying their operations to not only manufacturing, but also servicing. And so not only is it helping nations um, have a bit more of mix in their energy consumption and production, but also provides opportunities for investors to have some skin in the game, if you will. Laz, we have a lot more to talk about. We're bumping up against a break. So we will take a quick break and be right back with Laz Tiant. Labenthal.com. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, with, back with Dominic Tavella and our guest this evening, Laz Tiant from Schroeder's. Laz, if you can, let's talk a little bit about Schroeder's. Here is a company that was founded in the 1800s, right? One of the old time um, investment companies in the world who have embraced ESG. You know, this, this new progressive way to think about investing in companies, which is to their credit. 
So talk a little bit about Schroeder's and, and how you guys got here and what's the process and, and the value added that you bring to investors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one thing I love about working at Schroeder specifically focusing on sustainability is our independence of thought, right? I, I come from working at different ESG research shops, uh, such as Sustainalytics, MSCI, and a lot of the market is very dependent on the research that those kind of firms put out to be able to integrate these kind of factors into the investment process. However, in coming to Schroeder's, it's very much so embedded in the culture and how the company operates that they've really, we have really built our own proprietary tool set of insights that just help our investors have a better starting spot, right? In terms of looking at the investable opportunities. My team, the sustainable investment team globally at this point, we're, we're pushing 40. And if you think about how we are separated, there's product development, there's ESG integration that works with the different investment teams closely. There's our active ownership team that's working alongside our investors on engaging companies on a number of these issues and, and voting on behalf of our, our clients, as well as our research team that also has a component that builds models and tools that I mentioned to be uh, part of the process for our portfolio managers. And, and so there's not only this independent of thought, but also a very forward looking way of understanding and contextualizing the risks and opportunities through that ESG or sustainability lens. Um, you know, for example, here focusing in the United States for a second, we built a municipal bond tool called Muse, um, Municipal US Sustainability Explorer, that considers a number of ESG factors and also geospatial type of capabilities to look at where there might be more vulnerabilities and susceptibilities to wildfire risk or seismic hazards, tropical storms, and be able to compare that against what does um, local government accountability look like in terms of setting forth environmental policies where they might have more vulnerabilities and susceptibility to those environmental issues. And being able to fact that, factor that in across 3,000 US counties where we can localize our understanding of where there could be projects that we can be invested in is just changing the way we can be considering our investment prospects, right? The same kind of capabilities are being applied to corporates and sovereigns broadly in understanding the financial and, and social impacts that they push off to society. So we have a tool called SustainX, which tries to factor in those positive and negative externalities that companies push off to society, meaning that, you know, telecommunications companies are providing connectivity, they're providing broadband, tobacco companies, you know, there's negative health expenditures, both public and private and, and smoking tobacco. And so we want to be able to take this information and understand, okay, there are these positive and negative impacts that companies push off, but is that crystallizing into financial consequences for those companies? So if you think about sugar taxes for beverage companies that might be operating in countries where there are sugar taxes, that's affecting their financials and how they operate. So that's what I'm talking about when we think about these externalities actually being priced in to our financial analysis and understanding what companies are navigating through those social pressures, those regulatory pressures, and show those long-term business prospects. So when I think about what I like about Schroeder's, it's having the dedication to not wait for these research insights and tools to be provided um, externally, but rather putting together the resources to build our own independent practice um, and achieving that. And then above all, the engagement practice that we've been building out and thinking about thematic issues like natural capital, biodiversity, and deforestation and engaging companies within the value chains um, most uh, connected to deforestation, for example, I think it, it means something different for investors to be able to have that kind of um, impact with executive management. And that's also to say the research, the data can't always provide you the full picture of what a good investable opportunity or worthwhile investable opportunity is. Many times it's connecting with those companies, being close to operations and seeing it firsthand to understand where those companies are going. And so throughout the life cycle of our investment process, whether it's the beginning stages and understanding where those opportunities lie, or at the end stages and reporting information back to our clients to be transparent that we're doing what we set out to do 
in the initial investment thesis is very, very important right now where you have other, you have a landscape where people want to be able to trust sustainability and ESG strategies, but to the point you made before about the window dressing, right, you want to avoid greenwashing. And so to be able to have our own research and tools drive investment decisions, but also be the same information that our clients contextualize their investments with, I think is a home run for us, right? And so we're going to continue to do that. And I'm excited to be a part of it. So let's just to, uh, give you an opportunity to add a little bit more to that. When I think of Schroeder's, I think international, I think global investing. So just spend a, one minute talking about where you guys are located around the world, how much assets you have under management. I want people to understand, our clients to understand the global picture you guys bring to the table. Yeah, absolutely. So I think at this point, we're hitting close in, in US dollars to a trillion. I'm a little short of that is my understanding, but I, I think we're getting close to that. And you're right, when people think of Schroeder's, I think international emerging markets is what comes up. We're headquartered in, in London, where you know, most of the group is. I think we're about 5,000 employees and the majority will be there. But from the emerging markets perspective, you know, we have offices in, in Mexico, we have offices in Argentina. And then you think about in the Asian markets, we're in Hong Kong, we're in Singapore. Um, so when it comes to having that local perspective, right, with being so focused in those markets, it's very, very vital to our business. And so I think that's why we've built such a good brand for ourselves for being able to grow in the past you know, 200 plus years in all of these markets and, and kind of build a foundation, if you will, on um, our approach, which is bottom up active, right? We're not a passive shop by any means. We are your traditional bottom up active managers, which I think for sustainability purposes is really important because right now what I see is very misunderstood understanding of sustainability and ESG, which for us is what we want because what most people misunderstand, we see opportunities to seek alpha and to have the presence globally and have that mantra to be seeking alpha on misunderstood opportunities puts us in a really good position right now. Laz, I, I thought I was going to get through one show without bringing up the pandemic and we got 45 minutes in, but I, I, I got to ask you a question as it relates to the pandemic and how companies treated their employees. So we're two years into this thing. I don't think a pandemic was on anyone's bingo card, especially in running a business. Right, Dominic, Dominic and I run a business. We, you know, we were winging it half the time in terms of, do we open? Do we not open? How do we open? Does Wall Street give businesses a pass with how they treated the last two years in keeping their employees safe versus watching the bottom line? Or has that been factored in more recently in how corporate America um, has treated their, their employees as it relates to their profitability? You know, it's a good question. And I would say, COVID has only highlighted the importance of things like human capital, labor relations, and the importance of employee retention and overall employee satisfaction, right? I think for businesses to run, they need people. Um, and so I hope that there has been kind of sympathy across the board for the struggle for some industries. However, it's only highlighted the need to engage with companies on their human capital management frameworks going forward, right? So it's, to me, it's not so much how did the market react to it in real time, it's more so how are they reacting to it for their future potential and having better businesses. And so you know, looking at it that way, it just leads to more engagement opportunity for us, which is great because it just better helps us understand how these companies plan to operate and how executive management plans to treat their employees, which you know, affects our decision-making. Laz, I, I touched on it a little earlier about where in the spectrum Europe is versus the U.S. versus perhaps China. And, and China gets a bad rap, I think, uh, but it seems like they're making progress. Would, would you guys say they are making progress? Are they heading in the right direction? Do they have the intent to head in the right direction? Global decarbonization is going to be, I think, the single most investable largest investable area for decades to come, right? I think Barry Fink might've said something similar recently. Um, China's not going to miss out on that. So as it relates to one, 
from an investment standpoint, aligning to a lot of the rules around transparency in terms of what it means to be sustainable. I think there's some alignment being put into place uh, in what's happening in Europe and what those regulators are trying to say. And then on the second side of things, when it comes to bringing these new technologies to market, there are a lot of component pieces of what can ultimately be energy efficient products that are going to be coming out of China, right? And so I think every country is looking to have their own competitive advantage. And I'm sure that market has theirs in, in a number of ways, whether it's having semiconductors that will be a huge component to electric vehicles and batteries and component for batteries to be cre created going forward, but then also infrastructure um, to also be able to build um, capabilities for similar power generation, distribution, et cetera, that can you know, bring the world to a, a lower carbon economy. So I don't cover or look at China closely, but I do think that there will be prospects there as there will be in other markets, both emerging and, and developed. Laz, we're just about out of time. Just one quick question, maybe it's a quick answer. As Dominic and I you know, put together asset allocated model portfolios, is there a benchmark that Schroeder's believes um, a portfolio should have a, a piece of an ESG um, sector in it? It's a fantastic question. We stick to our traditional performance benchmarks. We're integrated with ESG across the board and there's no reason why we should have a specific ESG benchmark. We should be able to measure ourselves against any performance benchmark that we would have in, a, in any sense um, in our investment process. And so I think that's really important right? Because to show that ESG does not give up on performance, you need to compare yourself against what you would have anyway. And so that's what we continue to do and then hopefully continue to beat those benchmarks. Laz, this, this was an important topic. It's, it's not going away. It's only becoming increasingly um, more important. And um, we appreciate your time this evening. And an opportunity to ask you these questions. And I think they, you know, we get them from clients all the time. And I think it's, it's a hot topic. I think it will continue to be such. And that's not a bad thing. So thank you for joining us, Les. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think this topic just helps us all get closer with our clients and our partners and understand what they're going for, right? And to meet them where they're at. So I um, hope to be here again and chat a bit about this a bit more next time. Looking forward to it, Les. Thank you. We'll definitely have you back. We will be right back after a quick break. You may also send an email to contact at labenthal.com. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman, back with Dominic Tavella with a quick wrap-up. And you know what, Dom? I guess it's it's good to hear that that ESG is is not window dressing, that companies are, are living the commitment. Uh, look, Mike, and I, I kind of brought it up during this discussion that you know what, you can have your opinion on climate change and, and such, but at the end of the day, it's just a bad business practice to pollute the environment, mistreat your employees or your customers, whether it's sexual harassment or racial issues. I mean, it is just bad business. We have seen so many companies suffer, you know, basically reputational risk and, and watch the stock price get decimated. Um, it's just bad business to be a bad actor in today's world. And you would think you would think that would be obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. And and it take it takes this movement and decades and 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 boycotts and and bad media to to get companies to change. And I think that's a balancing act. Which ones change because they had to because they didn't want negative media and which ones were truly committed to it and are the good actors. Yeah, Mike, look, you and I, again, grew up in the business. I, I hate to keep dating us, but, you know, there's a lot of times a company did something or the president of a company did something and it was kind of swept under the rug. Today, social media, everybody's got a camera on their phone, word gets out instantaneously. And boy, we have seen headline after headline where you go, what was that company thinking? What was some executive at that company thinking? thinking? Don't they know that emails don't go away? <laughs> or, or video clips of bad behavior don't go away? Um, today, companies and stock price of those companies can suffer dearly for bad behavior. 
Yeah, and but but like I said, Dom, it's still it's still a balancing act. And I think the company right now that's in the spotlight is a good example is Spotify. Right? They have a host who's controversial, yet he's very profitable. And 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 there and forget the stock price for a minute. There's a whole host of people who think he should be gone, right? And there's a whole host of other people who think, do you cancel everyone, right? Does, does, does everyone just get canceled? And that's not an easy place for any company to be in. No, and we've watched it across uh, the networks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially recently where some very mm -hmm. high up network, network executives had to uh, be fired or resign, whatever way you want to call it. Um, but I'm going to come back and put the greed hat on and that specific company, look what has happened to the stock price. Got you crushed. get punished. Yep. So I'm not, I'm not into the cancel culture and I do believe in free speech in this country. Having said that, you, the price stock price of your company can get and will get punished. So being a good citizen above all, and, and we, we talked to Laz about this, what does that actually mean? How do we define that? But I think generally speaking, being a good corporate citizen is a healthy place for, for in terms of your corporate price of your stock and the corporate health. Yeah, look, I think, I think Facebook is another good example of that. I mean, you know, the, the, the 20 election is two years old already, but they were, they were, they had negative publicity all of the time. And, and, and now it's just a function of, do people have Facebook fatigue, right? Is that something that is, has run its course or are people just punishing Facebook because they really feel to your point that the, the people who run it are, are bad actors. And look, um, at the end of the day, it's not you need a crystal ball to figure out what, where and when some of these things are going to hit. But if you do the level of work and research that Schroeder does and basically say, you know what, we're going to try to put the best team on the field we possibly can, even if one of those uh, players just ends up blowing you up doesn't blow up the whole team, doesn't blow up the whole game. And I, and I think that's part of our process to try to say, you know what, we want the best players we can get on, on a team. Right. And, and the other part of that is also asset allocation, right? Where, where even, even if we do stumble upon a, 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 and get an unintended consequence, um, we're never going to put our clients in a position where they're going to get blown up because we're never going to own enough of any one thing to put our clients in that space. Yep. Uh, and we always joke and talk about this idea of a team and that's diversification, right? Having all these different players, different asset allocated uh, components of the equities and fixed income and around the world, um, but also doing a very clean job to make sure those players are, are the best we can possibly get. Right. And, and I am, I am just to put a bow on this. I am happy that um, ESG is kind of here to here to stay and, and really has gotten some inroads and, and, as you said, it's a great expression. We are trying to get rid of the bad actors one at a time. And, when, and, and I think we've done a better job of doing that. Um, again, it's growing. It becomes part of the process today. And uh, for the foreseeable future, that can only be a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And I, th I think you would agree on that, Mike. Oh, yeah. It's, and it's, as you said, it's definitely not going away. It's almost to the point now where if someone gets in trouble. They almost have to they have to fall on their own sword because they know they know they're done. So they just walk out with some dignity and resign rather than wait two days to be fired. Um, look, we, we, we probably could talk about it for another hour. And I know we're closing in on, on being done with today's show, um, but the pendulum does swing sometimes too far to the right or too far to the left. But generally speaking, good, healthy, uh, it, it, ecological, employee-driven companies do perform better over the long run. Um, and that's not a bad thing that they get rewarded for being for being positive in, in these issues. Right. And just to be clear, you were not talking politically left or right. You just meant metaphorically how the pendulum swings. So, just um, yeah, look, uh, uh, politically, these the, it just gets to be so much noise after a while and it's exhausting. Right. But we have a responsibility to try to put good businesses, good companies in our client portfolios. And again, I'm oversimplifying it, but good corporate citizens typically don't blow up their companies. And if they don't blow up their companies, then the stock prices don't blow up. And I know I'm oversimplifying this because it's not quite as black and white as that, but avoid certain companies that have not been good corporate citizens or don't act like good corporate citizens. Um, that already gives you a leg up on a positive return. So sounds kind of obvious, but 
you'd be amazed. You brought it up. Um, how, what were they thinking <laughs> moments we see almost on a daily basis? Dominic, we are out of time, my friend. We could talk all night, but we not on voice all night, and, and, uh, <laughs> But we have to leave some for the next show. So uh, we'll see you next week, Mike. Have a great night. Be safe. Talk to you soon. As the saying goes, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Have a good night. Night all. <laughs>